Dakota Women's yeah. Business Center, and I'm going to have David say where he's from. And then um, they are going to be presenting on Safeguarding Success, Unlocking the Power of Patents and Trademarks for Small Businesses. Thank you, Katie. Uh, hey, everyone. I am Christy Dower. I'm the executive director of the North Dakota Women's Business Center. Uh, and uh, a little bit about what we do and what we provide for you as small businesses. Uh, our mission is to, it's a, we are an inclusive uh, business center, so we uh, provide resources, accessibility, and advocacy to small businesses. Uh, we've got a team that's, uh, we have a, a small but mighty team. We are statewide. Uh, and so uh, to support clients um, uh, across the state. Our board were uh, also positioned statewide. Uh, and so with the support of our board, we've done some strategic changes to uh, our programming. Um, again, hitting this pretty hard because we were pretty saturated in Bismarck and Fargo previously. So uh, we are statewide to support you where you're at in your business. We are funded in part by the Small Business Administration. Uh, you're also going to hear from Dell, so I like to call uh, SBA uh, the umbrella, and then underneath there was Women's Business Center, SCORE, SBDC, and then VBOC for veterans. Uh, and then uh, we also receive uh, cooperative uh, dollars through the partner budget through the Department of Commerce as well. We serve, uh, again, through virtual and hands-on training. So my team uh, actually this morning was in Wapaton uh, with a networking event in Wapaton and so I get to be with you all today. Uh, again, a big thing uh, that we provide is the collective voice of our, our um, clients. Uh, I, tr I travel to DC and often get asked about uh, the stories in rural communities and so uh, we use that platform to help uh, spread awareness. Um, we, uh, David is gonna come up and, and talk in a, minute, in a minute here, but we were actually in Gardner, uh, North Dakota, hearing from a client this week, and uh, who's had uh, some uh, dupes on Timu, and so how that's affecting her business and um, and so uh, what we can do with that is, is, is bring that to another level and help her in that support. Business coaching, so this is what the SBA grant funds us to do. So we provide free and confidential business coaching. Uh, and all of our, our entire team is actually certified uh, business coaches. And so we provide, uh, whether it's business resources, uh, if it's business planning, financial literacy, uh, we have those tools to help you out with where you're at in your business. The top reasons clients access our programs are business plans, buying and selling businesses, financing and capital, and startup assistance. We also have a certification. So uh, we have a state certification through um, uh, and it is a women business certification. You have to be at least 51% women owned. This provides a platform uh, for um, additional resources. Our state doesn't actually give preferential points for this certification, but it often can help uh, provide um, uh, access to other procurement opportunities, a network of um, additional resources. So um, we have our summit. So we are headed back to Medora. Anybody attend our summit last year? Uh, Ashton, who you heard from earlier, will be there as one of the speakers uh, to talk about marketing. So May 1st through the 3rd, we'll be back in Medora. Uh, we strategically picked Medora. I know some audience in Bis some of our audience in Bismarck uh, was was frustrated that y'all have to travel further now to go to, to Medora, but. We're really excited uh, to be there, and it's uh, it's a great opportunity to connect with other like-minded business owners. And uh, we have workbooks. We it's it's very deep into the financials of your business, 
the long-term strategies within your business and honest conversations about how to hire that next employee. Uh, we're really excited. We'd be honored if you'd join us. We hope the weather is just as nice as it was last year in Medora. Um, intensives. So these are um, scattered throughout the state. Um, we have both industry intensives, so child care businesses have, uh, fun fact, I almost left corporate America to start a child care business, but then I found out how much the margins were uh, and how, um, and how uh, uh, thankless that job can be sometimes, I guess. So um, we have specific industries such as retail or child care uh, intensives. And then we also have the leadership intensives as well. So um, those are virtual. Uh, and um, the next one that's coming up, I believe, is the, the retail one. So if that's of interest to you, um, uh, we just graduated, I think, 10 um, from that program. Strong Women, Strong Connections. So this one is what was going on today in Wapaton. Um, I think our next one actually is in June in Watford City. Uh, and it's a it's an authentic conversation over a panel discussion uh, about business. Funding Friday. So this is a social media campaign that every Friday we share different funding opportunities vetted by our team. Um, I think last month we had over 1,200 clicks to this site, uh, and we've had some success stories. So these are nationally um, vetted opportunities. They're not just for women. So there's uh, um, sometimes they're, they're very specific or niche uh, businesses, but some of them are for operations too. So please follow us on social media. Uh, the library, this was my COVID baby, um, but it is, still, um, it is still active. So we received some COVID dollars to uh, provide a free and um, digital content uh, through our uh, website, it's called the library. Thank you. Yeah, it's a software-based company out of North Dakota that helped us build this. Another resource, because we just love resources, uh, is um, we partnered with Verizon. So this is another uh, free uh, resource. Uh, and Verizon has um, how to monetize your social media on there. Uh, and so can pause if you want to. It, it does require they don't spam you, they don't have to cell phones, but it is a really great resource. Uh, and they're pretty bite-sized, like 28-minute videos. Uh, and then they also have cohorts that you can join other business owners nationally uh, to um, for grants. So they have what's called the LISC grant. Um, and I think if you watch two videos, it'll unlock this rural grant, and it's like $10,000, I think. Love to do testimonials. So this is uh, uh, Jasmine from African Nomad Catering. So she's local to Bismarck. And follow us, we'd love for you to check it out. Um, we also, if you subscribe to our newsletter, uh, we have um, uh, free downloadable content called One Page Wonders. And so sometimes they're about how to uh, register your business or how to sell to a border state or um, different uh, on-demand resources. They're really good. Thank you. I don't <laughs> utilize any of it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, you know, the other really great uh, part of what we do is um, uh, we aren't experts in everything. And so we're really excited to have an expert in the room, uh, David, um, from the US Patent and Trade Office. Uh, and we've asked him to join us today to talk a lot of what we get, um, especially from Pride of Dakota clients, is uh, they don't under, uh, many will call and say, I didn't realize I had intellectual property until I got a cease and desist letter, or I didn't know I needed to copyright something, or I didn't know I actually could have looked into a patent on this. So we asked David uh, to provide some education around that today. So um, David, if you'd like to come up and attempt to pull up your... It's gonna go crazy.
Good morning. My name is David Lay. I am the Assistant Director of the Rocky Mountain Regional Office of the United States Patent and Trademark Office. We're based out of Denver. Uh, for 200 and some odd years uh, plus, the Patent and Trademark Office was only in the D.C. area. And about 12, 13 years ago, uh, Congress decided that regional offices sounded like a good idea because inventions and innovation happens everywhere. And so uh, we have four regional offices for now, um, Detroit, Dallas, Denver, and San Jose, and then the newest one will be in Atlanta, Georgia. So we've kind of put ourselves across the country so we can be accessible to um, everybody out in you know, the rest of the country outside of D.C. If you can't have the means to get to D.C. and ask questions, that's why we get to come to you now and provide some of this educational stuff. Um, disclaimer, this is not legal advice. Uh, Despite the fact that I did go to law school, I was terrible and I did not ever do any real law stuff, and so that's why I work for the government. But I will be giving you educational pieces uh, as to you know what's the importance of patents and trademarks um, and kind of differentiating that. Does anybody in this room have a trademark or a patent? A couple people? Sweet. Then you know the process. Then you can teach the class. <laughs> All right, um, this is really small on the screen. Uh, but this is kind of a brief overview. Um, I'm going to try to go brief, uh, quickly over this because that's a lot of information. This is, I call this a verbal vomit. It's just too much to look at sometimes. But in general, there's four major categories of intellectual property, IP for short. Um, intellectual property was actually written into the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8. Uh, so it's been, has a long history of protection in the U.S. government. Um, the easiest form of IP to kind of digest is trade secrets. Uh, trade secrets is exactly as it sounds, it's just a secret. Uh, things like the kernel's secret recipe, the Coke formula, Google's search algorithm, uh, things like that, what are, uh, they don't reveal it to the public, but it's kind of what their brands or uh, companies are known for, right? And so. Um, the easiest way to lose a trade secret is to tell somebody, because um, obviously somebody's going to be able to reproduce what you have, your secret sauce, all that stuff. And so, um, I, well, I've heard a lot of food companies that are, you know, such that are coming in here this room today. So if you have a secret recipe and that becomes successful, maybe think about not telling people. So, uh, the next one, copyrights. Uh, I'm going to assume that the majority of this room has a smartphone and has taken a picture with their smartphone. Every time you cl click that button, you got a copyright on something that you created. That picture, you own a copyright for that. Um, what differentiates that from getting protection for that copyright is if you record it with the Library of Congress, which is a separate entity than our office, they handle the copyrights for uh, the federal or for the United States. You can prevent others from putting that on a T-shirt on Etsy or a mug or something like that. And so, while you create a copyright. Uh, by taking that picture, you have to be able to register it before you can enforce um, that stuff. This is going to be really fast, so if you have questions later on, feel free to grab a card and then contact us. We do one-on-one -on -one meetings all the time. I can come back at some point. Uh, I might be back in Fargo in June. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you have questions, then feel free to contact me later. Uh, the easiest one for everybody to understand, uh, understand is a trademark. Um, a few of you have trademarks already. That's the logo, that's the branding, that's the phrases. Uh, I saw the North Dakota be legendary and they have a little TM on there. It actually might be federally registered now. But, um, you know, when you, when you have something that identifies a source, um, that's kind of what triggers everybody's trademark. Um, they can be words, they can be logos, like I said. They can even be colors. Um, the, the brown delivery trucks, whenever they come to your door, most people are going to know that's UPS. UPS brown is uh, something that's trademarked. Uh, Tiffany blue, the, the little blue jewelry boxes. Robin's egg blue, I believe, is the, the color that is trademarked. Uh, John Deere green um, is also that. That's a local connection there to North Dakota. Smells can be trademarked. Uh, I never really played with Play-Doh, but I know what it smells like. And so if you have that smell, you know that it's Play-Doh, right? It identifies that source of um, that company. And so, um, other weird trademarks are the look and feel of something, uh, the shape of Coke bottles, the look of an Apple store. 
if you walk into an Apple store, it's that clean, white, you know, tabletop with all this stuff. They got a trademark uh, for their trade dress of that the way that it appears in the store. And then the most complicated and frustrating part for most people is uh, patents. Uh, patents usually protect the widget normally, right? If you have a product, uh, you have uh, a process to make something, uh, if you are into uh, lotions even, uh, or uh, shampoos or whatever it may be, you might be able to get a patent for that because of a specific formula that you create for that stuff. Uh, if you have a, a widget, a, you know, electronics, you're going to get a patent normally to protect that stuff. The reason intellectual property even exists is because the U.S. government thought it would be good to have these ideas put out in the public and in return you get a monopoly for a certain amount of time uh, to prevent others to, uh, from making or using or selling your product. Um, after that time elapses, then uh, it goes out to the public and then they can innovate and make that better or uh, utilize that. Um, otherwise, there would just be unfair monopolies throughout history. Uh, nobody would ever have other painkillers than whoever created the first uh, formula of acetaminophen or you know, Tylenol, Aleve, whatever it may be. And so uh, it's to encourage innovation by kind of lengthening or shortening the ownership rights. Um, on the right side, that, those are kind of the terms where, um, of ownership that you have for that. Um, we talked about this yesterday, Steamboat Willie from Disney is now in the public domain. Um, Disney was the, one of the biggest companies that affected copyright law over the last hundred years and now uh, it's kind of hit the threshold of how long protection lasts for that. Uh, as I mentioned, trade secrets, those are two big uh, known things for trade secrets. Uh, so the Circle C is uh, what the Library of Congress used to indicate the, that you actually have a copyright on, or a recorded copyright on things. Um, those are the terms, and it just, you know, protects the original works of authorship. Uh, things that you, other than the pictures on your phones, things that you write, presentation, material, uh, pamphlets, um, any of the wording on packaging could be copyrighted, uh, statues, um, yeah. So when you think of art or you know things that are written, those are things that are protected by copyright. There, songs, yeah. I think the big part of what small businesses really want to know is uh, why I need to get a trademark, or how do I get it, or what's the best way to get a trademark. Uh, I often use an example of Mexican food. Um, if you have a storefront and it's called the burrito shop, you're probably not going to get a trademark for that. It's really generic. Um, people are going to be like, well, assumingly he's going to be selling, you know, burritos. And so the, the office is probably not going to give you a trademark for that. I don't know that for sure, but I'm just going to assume that. Um, then we start going up the ladder, right? And so um, descriptive is, you know, the level between the burrito shop versus Benny's Mexican food or something like that. Um, it, it, it's a little bit more descriptive as to what you're trying to sell, but it's still pretty broad and most likely the protection is not going to be strong enough if you try to register that trademark. When we get to suggestive, we have things like Chipotle. Chipotle is a name of pepper. Um, it could indicate that they're going to sell Mexican food or, you know, peppers or something like that. They obviously are known for the burritos and um, Tex-Mex food. And so that's, they got a little bit more uh, of a higher standard there uh, in terms of trademark protection. And then we have Qdoba. Um, I don't know if there's Qdobas anywhere around here, but uh, that's completely made up word. That's why it's the strongest protection. If you just make up a random word and you associate it with your company, most of the time that's going to be pretty good for uh, trademark protection and that's something that you should consider for your brand. So when you register trademarks, you normally do so in certain classes. Uh, if you have a particular uh, category of what you're trying to focus on, your trademarks are normally going to stick to that category. Class 25 is like clothing, um, broadly. And so, if you you know register your, register your logo and uh, you do it in class 25, then you only 
plan on selling clothing uh, like materials. You're not planning to go into uh, some of these services, uh, you know, the dental services or anything like that. So um, that's why there's coexisting brands that you can see that have trademark protection, even though they're named the same thing. No one's going to assume that Dove uh, Soaps is going to be making chocolate. Um, maybe, but that'd be weird. Uh, you know, if Dove Soaps decides to make lotions, that's probably close enough that, that you would know that it's coming from the same person that makes this, uh, the lotions and soaps, right? They're, they're probably closely related there, but no one's going to assume it's the chocolate company that's doing that either. The three different deltas, um, faucets, airline, and the dental, obviously completely different categories of what they're providing to people. Um, their logos are identifiable to you, but they're all separate uh, categories there. If you register your website, it does not necessarily mean you have a trademark. Um, it, it's one of those things that it's really uh, confusing to people because they, they, they want to have their website, they want to have all their material ready to go, and so they think that they're being protecting themselves, they're protecting themselves by having websites, but registration doesn't do anything for you until you actually um, file with the Patent Trademark Office. Um, same thing if you go to the uh, Secretary of State and file for your um, corporation license or whatever it is, the $25, $30, whatever it may be, that doesn't give you a trademark either. More examples of that. Common law trademarks. When you just start up and you decide that your company's name is whatever it may be, um, that you start using your name into uh, commerce. That creates a common law trademark. Uh, you can register with your specific state to have a trademark, but that does not give you federal uh, protection. The reason you want federal protection is it goes extends across all 50 states in uh, the country, and then you're um, putting everybody on notice through our database. Uh, if you do it within the state, and you don't, I mean, some people may not ever want to spend the money. Uh, and I say the money because it's not too much. It's $250 to file for a trademark per class. I mean, I'm sure most people spend more than that just on R&D sometimes or a logo. You paying graphic designers thousands of dollars for a logo. And so uh, registering your trademark uh, for your company might be something that you consider um, when you're operating your business. The, the circle R means it's been actually registered with our office. Uh, you can't use that until it's actually registered. Uh, the TM, SM, uh, that means trademark and service mark. Those are mean, you're just showing people that you're using your specific logo, phrase, um, branding, whatever it may be, color, and you're intending to use it as a trademark. Um, it doesn't give you any protection unless you actually uh, register, like I keep mentioning, but it does put people on notice. Uh, the main point of this slide is it gives you protection. That's a lot of words. If you want to read it, great. Uh, if not, then we can send you the slides. But yeah, it gives you protection is the main uh, purpose of having your registration rights there. All right, uh, patents, uh, a little weedy. There's three different types of patents. There's design patents that cover kind of just the ornamental shape of something, more so than the function. Uh, there's different water bottles in this room right now. Uh, they all act like a water bottle, but the shape of some of them may have design features that are different than other water bottles, and they don't change the function of them, they just change the look. Uh, same thing with shoes. Uh, shoes are all kind of shoes, uh, but if you have a certain shape, then you can get a design patent for that. Um, then there's plant patents, that's a little bit uh, of a niche area, is for asexually produced plants. Um, they're not naturally occurring plants, that's basically genetic uh, modifications of plants, and so you can get pat patents for that stuff. They're the only ones that come in color, uh, I think there's an example later, but they're the only ones that come in color, the rest of them are just black and white text. And then utility patents are kind of the main uh, area of patents. They cover the process, as I mentioned, or the actual product that you are trying to get protection for. There's the color of the plant patent. Um, if, you're, if you have an idea and you think, should I get a patent for this? My suggestion is always go on the internet. 
use the Google search engine because they have a database of all of our patents and just kind of type out what you think you are trying to invent and see if something's out there. It's not going to be exact. You're going to have to do a little bit of digging. You're going to have to use broader words and stuff like that, but it gives you an idea of whether someone has already come up with that or uh, whether someone has applied for a patent application for that. Uh, there's certain limits, uh, certain requirements to file for uh, patents. Um, usually a one year kind of time frame from when it gets public. So if you're a professor, you have a research paper, you wait two years to decide I want to file a patent application, your research paper can be used against you um, because that wasn't filed within the year of that first uh, public uh, disclosure of it. You could just keep it secret. There are different ways to, you know, just develop RD and then uh, file for your patent application. But in general, don't just tell everybody about it and try to get your patent. Um, same thing as the other slide about trademarks. I mean, your, your biggest thing is protection. You're trying to prevent others from making, using, or selling. Um, lots of companies obviously make lots of money doing so. There was a multi, multi billion dollar settlement or a lawsuit that, uh, between Apple and Samsung like 10 years ago just about a bezel of a phone. I mean, that's a really small aspect of something, but that costs Samsung a lot of money, so. Uh, obviously, I've been kind of stressing why it's important. Um, it's, you know, it's about your, your, the effort you put into your company, your products, your invention, your food recipes, your branding, your logo, everything that you have put into your business so far, you want to protect it, basically, right? And so, uh, taking the steps necessary, it may seem daunting, but that's why we're kind of here to tell you how, uh, you know, pretty simple it is a lot of the times, give you the resources, connect you to the right people. Uh, while we don't do any type of funding, we can connect you to the people that can provide the funding. We can connect you to SBA reps, um, <laughs> SBIR reps if you're doing, uh, you know, a lot of the government type uh, path for your invention company. Uh, obviously, Everybody's end goal, if you're trying to start a business, is usually to make money. Um, having the intellectual property provides you that avenue. If you've watched Shark Tank, which I assume most people have kind of gotten a glimpse of Shark Tank, uh, that you know it's all about the money, right? And so they ask a lot of the times, what's your IP look like? Uh, what do you have patents? Do you have trademarks? Et cetera. And so it puts the world on notice that you're kind of serious and that you're ready to enter the market and make some real money for uh, most of the part there. Some uh, stats from a few years back. Um, the, the government doesn't update everything all the time, but these are stats from a few years ago, and so it'd be really interesting to see what the pandemic has really done, because there have been so many small businesses that have opened, while other bigger industries, restaurants, for example, have kind of shut down a little bit more um, than previous. But um, in Denver, we saw, we've saw we seen a bunch of small restaurants open up and the bigger chains kind of die off and it's just uh, people have decided that they want to, you know, capture the lightning in a bottle and run with it and see what happens. But um, here's how North Dakota kind of ranks in terms of percentages uh, in the industry. Uh, the whole point of IP intensive industries is they always produce more money, essentially. Um, there's multiple, multiple papers out there. If you want to see uh, how it affects the how IP affects the economy, um, the link that you can't even click on uh, because you're looking at a presentation uh, is something that you can read up on and see how much more money is made through IP intensive industries. Here's a few examples of uh, patents that uh, are from North Dakota. Uh, we met with Swen Products the other day. Uh, this was this was filed a few years ago, and so this is one of their design patents. But they just recently got one at the end of February, and um, this is for oh, this is for their scoreboard. So yeah, uh, we went and saw their factory. They produce the scoreboards in house in North Dakota, and they have a design patent for their uh, their legs there. But you can't really see it. it's dotted right there, and. Um, pretty sure 
Uh, this is Bobcat, and this is Bobcat Patton. So, as I mentioned, uh, we have the be legendary as a registered trademark. There we go. Um, on our, if you just look up trademark search in USPTO, you can kind of look. Uh, if you have a, a name that you're thinking of or something like that, you go on there, search, and see if it's used by somebody else. It'll either say live or dead, um, or canceled, uh, and then it'll register. The green means someone's actually using it, uh, and it's still something that you probably shouldn't use. Otherwise, you might get a cease and desist, or it might get sued. Uh, red, if you see red, that's the other side where it says dead. Then you may be able to utilize that name, but if somebody wants to come back and use it again, then you might get into a little court battle with them for that. We have a bunch of resources uh, on our website. I always warn people that it's a government website, so everything's on there. Um, that's a good thing and the bad thing. You got a lot of information to go through uh, when we go on government websites. So if you don't know what you have, th th we have tools that will help you assess uh, whether this should be something that you're looking to for a trademark, a copyright, a patent, etc. Same thing with startup information. If you're trying to find funding, we uh, link you to some of our organizations that we work with. Um, as Christy mentioned, she can get you started over there at the Women's Business Center. Um, that's our regional office, downtown Denver. It's ugly. Um, if you ever want to drop by and have a, take a tour of it, cool, let me know. But I wouldn't advise it. <laughs> um, I don't want to go to the office anymore, so just let you know. I started a month before, I started this role a month before the pandemic started, and I've been in the office maybe, you don't know, three times a year at this point after the pandemic. Um, patent and trade support, blah. Patent and Trademark Resource Centers. These are user, usually at universities or public libraries. Uh, they are operating as their own library, but they are their librarians are trained for our search systems. So they can help you look for um, patent applications or trademark applications if you have an idea. You just go up there and talk to them. Uh, you have one in Grand Forks, um, and the other one looks like Lincoln. Is that what we established? Okay. Um, and there's one now in South Dakota, so this map will be updated really soon. But um, our director's trying to do a couple more. By a couple, I mean like she sent in emails to 600 libraries. Um, so in the next few years, maybe we'll add a couple more resource centers that are available to more people. Law school certification clinics. So this is the, the part of the conversation that we did say things are uh, not as expensive as they seem. Most of the time when you're filing for a patent or a trademark, the biggest cost is going to be with an attorney. Uh, they estimate patents cost about $30,000 to get. 95% of that is probably attorney's fees. Uh, there's a fee listing on our website as to what fees go to our agency. You have to, while you, when you file for an application, there's a certain amount of fees uh, certain for certain processes. Um, it's relatively cheap compared to the attorney's fees. Programs like the law school clinic are law schools that are participating uh, with the help of students to file your applications for you um, under the uh, guidance of an actual attorney that's been approved by us, essentially. Uh, all patent attorneys have to take an extra exam, a bar exam, to be called patent attorneys and registered with the, our office. And so they monitor and watch over these uh, students that are doing your applications. Um, as you can see, some of them are only trademark specific or patent specific, uh, while a bunch of them do everything. Uh, certain schools are open to the, everybody in the country, so if you have an idea and you you know you have time to sit in their queue, then it may be something you look into. The other option is this patent pro bono program. Uh, when the regional offices uh, got approved by Congress, they really uh, kind of emphasize this program. There's a program in all 50 states that is free legal service uh, in terms of patent applications, um, sometimes trademark applications. Um, and like I said, it, the, the hardest part is covering the cost of those attorneys. And so getting the free legal work um, is one of those things that you can do. Oh, and if there's an income threshold. Uh, it's like three times the 
um, what is the term? No, uh, I forget what it is, but the number is about 190,000 right now. If your income is below 190,000, you qualify. I don't make that much, so I would have qualified it if I was out there. But yeah, um, most of these programs require you to actually like be ready to file essentially. So. Um, they don't want everybody to just, you know, hey, I got this idea, hey, I got this idea. Um, they want you to be more prepared and say, uh, I'm at this stage with my company, I think I, I need to proceed with my patent application. The one that operates uh, for North Dakota, or the Dakotas in general, uh, is Legal Corp. They're based out of Minneapolis, I believe. And so that's the information if you um, want to reach out to them. Uh, lots of federal funding available. Uh, I'm not an expert on this. This is kind of just our slide that's our, that slide that slide deck that is out there. Um, SBA, SBIR, uh, NSF grants everywhere. Grants.gov is terrible, but so are our, every, so is every other government website. So um, I would go talk to the local experts if I was you, um, and you have resources available in this room. So uh, yeah. Uh, oftentimes we have uh, pilot programs, so the average time frame to get your patent application looked at by anybody when you file is about two years. That's how long it takes for it to hit someone's desk. Um, we have 600,000-ish applications a year that are filed at the patent office. Uh, we grant also about 300,000-ish every year, and so, I mean, that's 300,000 extra per year that are just amassing the uh, 9,000 engineers that are there uh, to examine these patents. So you can do the math, that's a lot of applications that are sitting there. Um, the time frame for trademarks is a lot less, it's less than a year currently. If you go on the trademarks website, it gives you actually a kind of a time frame of what applications are being examined at this point in time. So uh, first time filer program is one of those advanced things that um, gets piloted. If you're a first time filer, you get that prosecution. We call it prosecution. Uh, it's just the examination process of that uh, patent application. But on average, it'll be t it'll take only about six months from when you file to when uh, the final decision is made. So uh, a couple years ago, obviously there was a COVID um, program. You could get advanced prosecution for that. Um, last year there was climate change applications. Uh, if you have technology that you know dealt with climate change and you got advanced prosecution then too. We have a couple of uh, national type collaborations with all the alphabet soups of government agencies. Uh, Stop Banks is one of those things that uh, is a road tour across the country. Uh, counterfeits are a big thing these days. You know you've made it whenever somebody starts ripping you off, um, but it's also really impactful to businesses. Um, and so uh, this is more of an educational piece. It brings a bunch of government agencies together to kind of help you out, give you resources that are available and to kind of stop the counterfeits that may be happening or things that you may be dealing with. CBP uh, has a process in place. They'll stop counterfeits at port for you if you record your uh, trademark or patent with them. They'll do the work for you. Um, so if you're selling on Amazon, somebody else is trying to import similar goods that are crappier and uh, cutting into your uh, margins, then uh, this might be a good option for you to kind of stop that there. Um, use the internet. This is just a lot of stuff, right? This is a, if you have questions on things, then obviously it's just easier to do a quick search um, if you want to have something specific you want to look at there. So. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me uh, or our office. Like I said, we're out doing this most of the time or else having meetings and trying to help people out. So um, if you have any questions, let me know. No? Great. Does have any questions? Yes? So we were trying to get our, we have two things. We have our, the name of our company, no, no quota, and we have a saying underneath that go ahead and spoke. We got that trademark. Our 
but how do you know whether you should get a patent or a trademark? I know she was trying, but then during the process of when she was trying to get our logo mm -hmm. patented, we changed it. We still use Dokota, but we changed the logo. So then what do you do? It still sounds like you should be getting a trademark for that as well. I think so too. Yeah. yeah. That, I mean, logos are under the realm of trademark. I'm not sure if she was telling you to patent specifically for the the composition of cookie dough or not, but no. if it's just if it's just the logo, then you're yeah. probably uh, seeking a trademark there. Okay. Spent a lot of money for that. I mean, she never got anywhere with it because they wanted so much information. Right. Um, you you're right, about that. right. Yeah. so if you're interested in um, kind of learning the process yourself, yep. we have eight part programs uh, for patents and trademarks. Uh, we call them the trademark bootcamp. It's an eight part series. You can go through the whole process. It, it's like one hour or two hours each class and uh, kind of learn the steps all the way through to filing. And so, as I mentioned, this, I mean, $250 as opposed to, I don't know how much you spent, I'm not going to ask, but yeah, it's going to, I'm going to assume it's going to be a lot. So. Normal attorney's fees are about two hundred fifty to five hundred dollars an hour. So, yeah.